Hello everyone, this is another video solutions to a 2020 practice FRQ that the brilliant Brian Passwater has put out there and it is specifically a rate in and rate out problem. Okay, so notice the table that we're given and I've already highlighted key things um, that you will that I will reference as I go through the video just to save a little bit of time. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with part A. Part A says, find the total amount of water that leaks out of the pool between T is equal to zero and T is equal to four minutes, okay? So the total amount of water that leaks out is already a form of displacement, which you see that I have right here on the bottom. Now, when we're looking at just leaks out, there are in fact two functions that were given to us. Highlighted or underlined in red was the rate in, which was h of t, and notice that this is an interpretation of a velocity function already with gallons per minute. So interpret this as f prime of x um, velocity function, not f of x position, okay? The other function that we're working with is the l of t. So l of t is a rate out piece, and that too was given to us as a velocity function of f prime of x because the units of measure were gallons per minute, okay? So if we want to find just the amount that leaks out, nothing to do with rate in, only leaking out, then we're only going to work with the L of T, okay? And we're going to work with that as far as the displacement, um, aka first fundamental theorem, so that we can find that displacement incurred between zero and four minutes. So let's go ahead and set it up. So I have the integral from zero to four, and it's going to be specifically of this function, Remember, this is a velocity function to find that um, displacement, that final minus the initial position. So this is that accumulation of change that has incurred between zero and four minutes. So we're simply going to put the velocity function here, otherwise given to us as L of t. Please do not put L prime of t as that represents the acceleration of leaking out. Okay, so L of t is going to be our integrand, and then we're going to have it in respect to t. And since this is non-calculator, we're going to go ahead and solve this out by setting it up with what we were given as far as the integral from 0 to 4, 25t over the square root of t squared plus 9, all in respect to t. Okay, so there is going to be a little bit of u substitution going on because our u substitution is that radicand in our denominator, which is going to be u is t squared plus 9. Therefore, du is 2t dt, and when we rewrite it, we're going to have one half of du is t dt. Okay, so where we had t dt in our original function, in our original integrand, we're now going to replace with one half du inside of our rewrite. Okay, so let's constant multiple rule this 25 out, so it becomes 25 over 2. And now it's just 1 over the square root of u, which I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that as u to the negative 1 half, and it's in terms, sorry, in respect to u. And now we have to remember to change our bounds. So 0 inside of our u sub is going to give us a value of 9 for our lower limit of integration. And then plugging in 4 inside of our u sub is going to be 16 plus 9, which gives us 25. Okay. So our, our integral of u to the negative one-half will become, well, u to the one-half over the new um, power, which you could just say multiplies by the reciprocal. And then we're going to multiply by this constant multiple rule of 25 over 2. All the while, this is still from 9 to 25. Okay? So if I plugged in, just first fundamental theorem, plug in 25 here, I'm going to take the square root of that to get 5 multiplied by 2 to get 10, so we would have 10 for that first piece. Okay, so minus, now plugging in our 9, our f of a value, if you will, the square root of 9 is 3, multiplied by 2 is going to be 6, so it's going to be subtracting the 6, which again, we have to make sure we multiply by that constant that we had pulled out of 25 over 2. So we have 10 minus 6, we have is 4, and 4 times 25 over 2 becomes 50. So our answer is going to become 50. So the total amount of water, because it's gallons per minute, we're going to go ahead and say is 
50 gallons. Let's go to part B. It says in part B, is the amount of water in the pool increasing or decreasing at time one minute? Okay, show the work that leads to your um, answer. So first of all, the amount of water, not the rate, okay? The amount of water is going to be interpreted as a position function, f of x, if you will. And remember, this is asking, is f of x, is the amount increasing or decreasing? Well, we remember that if f of x is increasing, that's, that's because its derivative is positive. And f of x was decreasing, then its derivative would be negative. So we want to know, is it increasing or decreasing? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and look at the amount as far as our position function. Okay. So our position function is going to use both rate in and rate out to see what's happening. Okay. So you have this tank, you have this pool actually, that is being filled with water and it has water leaking out at the same time. Okay. So that's your new. Um, amount as far as showing what what's going to happen. Okay, so if I wanted to say I have the in rate, and then I also have the out rate or rate out, if you will, and I know that the rate out is a negative. Okay, and this one was given to us as L of t, and the rate in was given to us as h of t. Okay, so if I'm adding these together they're going to look something like the following, okay? I'm gonna say that I have this new rate, if you will, this new rate that accounts for both of them adding together. Again, I put this negative here because it's a rate out, means it's decreasing. And we're gonna call this um, a new rate. We're gonna call this, we can call it A prime of T, if you will, okay? So I'm trying to see at, Time is equal to 1 in both the rate in function and the rate out function. When I've added them together, again, this is a negative because it's decreasing when I'm doing rate out. So it's like adding a negative. Then it will give me my new rate. And this new rate right here that I'm highlighting in purple, is it? it's correlated to this F prime of X, if you will. So if this purple A prime of T is positive, then the amount was increasing. However, if it's negative, then the amount would be decreasing, okay? So let's go ahead and find out what is h of one, okay? So our h function is up here, and h of one, so here's h of t. Now again, please do not be confused that this is a position, this is an actual velocity function given to us. So if I want the n rate, whoops, if I want the end rate, it's like saying f prime of x. What's f prime of x at 1? Okay, so h of t at 1 is 13. So we would have 13. Now we're going to subtract L of 1. Again, L is representing a rate, not a position, but a velocity function. Okay, so if I plug in 1, I would have 1 plus 9, or 1 squared plus nine is 10, and the square root of that is a little bit over um, three, if you will, but it's positive. And then if I put one up top, it's gonna to be like a positive 25 over this um, positive, a little bit over three, okay? So we're gonna say that it's subtracting like 25 over three-ish, if you will, and this is gonna be our a prime of t value. Okay, so we just have to, without a calculator, see, is this going to be a positive or a negative? Well, if I multiply by a form of 1, which is 3 over 3, so that I have common denominators, you can see that it's going to be 39 minus 25, again, over some kind of 3, a little bit over 3-ish value. Well, this is obviously going to be a positive value for a prime of t, okay? So our new rate is already showing positive, and thus it's going to be bigger than zero, if you will, okay? So I know I rounded those numbers, but if you were to use the exact and, and simplify it out, you would get 13, whoops, you would get the 13 minus 25 over root 10, and it obviously is bigger than zero. 
And because it's bigger than zero, we're saying it's positive. This A prime of T interpretation, this new rate is positive, and thus its position function interpretation would be increasing. Okay? So we would say increasing, thus increasing um, at T is equal to 1. All right. So let's move on to C. C says, use a Riemann sum with three subintervals given by the table to approximate the total, okay, the total amount of water poured into the tank between zero and four minutes. So again, you have to be careful with these rate in and rate out problems. Sometimes you'll use both rates. Sometimes you'll only use one, just like we used one on part A, but we used two rates on part B. Okay, so this one is only looking for the poured out of the tank between specifically these times. Okay, so we're immediately going to be thinking of, oh, sorry, not poured out, my bad, poured into the tank. We're going to be looking specifically at our rate in function. Okay, so our rate in function is H of T, and that was given in the table up top. Okay. And we want to simply look at this as a left Riemann sum from 0 to 4. Okay, so if I go up here and I'm interpreting a left Riemann sum from 0 to 4, you can see with the question asking three subintervals, okay, three subintervals right here, and we're going for the left Riemann sum, these are the jumps that we're going to use. Okay, so our first rectangle, if you will, oops, let me make this a little bit cleaner. Our first rectangle is going to have a dx or a width of 1, okay? And then our second one is going to have a width or a jump, if you will, a dx of 2. And then our third one is going to have a jump between 3 and 4. Remember, you're looking at x values of just 1. And now, because we're looking at our left Riemann sums, I want to look at the left tips, if you will, of these three rectangles. Okay, because I'm looking at these specific heights. Okay, so for this first one, the height is 30, the second one, the height is 13, and the third one, the height would be 5. So the way we've highlighted these, if I were to go down and write them as a left Riemann sum, it would be the base times the height. So again, just like we highlighted before, 1 by 30 would be the base times the height of the first one. So we have 1 by 30. And then we're going to add the base times the height of the second, which again was 2 and 13. So we'll write down here 2 and 13. And then the last one, which we have, is a jump of 1, again, between 3 and 4, with a height of 5. So that we have 1 with a height of 5. Yes, we are adding all of these up together, and they're going to equal 61. Okay, this is the left Riemann sum, otherwise written as the integral between 0 and 4 of our rate in function, because it's that accumulation of change kind of interpretation. And we can simply, we could have written it as this also. So let me go ahead and rewrite it and kind of copy it over here. You kind of reduce size. And it would look something like that. Okay. So either one, whether you're writing out the L sub 3, otherwise the notation when doing Riemann sums, you could write it like this, but it is preferred because the interpretation is that area underneath the graph to write it as the integral from 0 to 4 of the following, which is going to equal to there at the end, 61. Okay, whoops, let me fix that real quick. All right, so let's keep going. Part D. Part D says, using the result from part C, we're going to approximate the amount of water in the pool at time t is equal to four minutes, okay? So first of all, let's approximate the amount of water in the pool at four minutes, okay? So there's a lot going on here. It does start off with first fundamental theorem, which you see down here, okay, where the integral of the velocity function is the same as displacement, otherwise final minus the initial position. And, but there's a little bit more going on here because if I were to rewrite this, I'm saying my final position or final amount 
is equivalent to my starting amount plus the accumulated change. Okay, and this accumulated change is a little bit a little bit more involved in this one because I have a rate in and a rate out problem. Okay, so that alone is going to have two integrals that are the interpretation of that accumulated change. I have a rate in and a rate out. It's basically going to say um, it's going to um, accommodate for both of them and account for both of them so that I see what is it at the very end as far as its value, and it, then I can see if it's an overestimate or a underestimate, okay? So let's go ahead and write our pieces in. First of all, our A value, okay, our starting time, if you will, our starting input is four, okay? So if I go and at four, I'm wondering, what was my given value originally set at, okay? Well, down here, or sorry, up here, my original value was, 120 gallons at time zero that's what my original value was okay so a sorry my mistake this four is actually the b value okay the a value comes from its starting on time if you will so the a value was the interpretation when t started at zero minutes okay so a is going to be zero and then B, let me highlight that in blue, B, otherwise 4, is going to be right here. So if I were to rewrite this out, I'm saying my amount, okay, F of, F of 4, if you will, F of 4, and I'm taking this right here, F of 4 is equal to F of 0, which we know F of 0 was 120. That's what we were starting off. It started off with that much water in it already. So we're going to say our starting value of 120. And then we're going to add this piece right here. Again, remember I told you that this is actually two integrals because I have a rate in to account for and a rate out to account for. Okay? So the rate in is going to be from 0 to 4 of h of t dt. Okay? And then the rate out is going to be L of t from 0 to 4 because that's that leaking water, and dt, well, we're, we're still in respect to t. And because it's leaking out, so this is in, whoops, thus it's positive, and this is leaking out, therefore it's going to be negative. And notice my use of parentheses here, it's because I'm adding this positive and I'm adding this negative. And yes, you could do it without parentheses if you want, because you know this positive wouldn't change the signs, of these other two. So you could simply write it just like this. Okay. And this is going to be the amount that I have after four minutes, accounting for everything, rate in and rate out. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at, at this because we've already solved pieces of this. Okay. We solved that 61 was what we got here as far as similar to this piece here. So we have 61 for the rate in accumulated amount. So we have 120 is where we started. I accumulated 61. And then this right here from 0 to 4 of L of T, we had way up here in part A. Okay. And that was 50 is what we got as an answer up top. So we're going to subtract that 50. And that's how much we have after four minutes in the pool. Okay. So 61 minus 50, we have 9. So if I add it, I'm simply going to get um, actually 61 minus 50 is 11. What am I thinking? And then 120 plus 11 will equal 131. So 131 gallons is how, uh, is how many gallons are in the pool after four minutes. Okay. So is this an overestimate or is this an underestimate? Well, up top, we saw in our paragraph that H of T, okay, H of T, let me go ahead and erase some of these values. Okay, it says H of T is differentiable and decreasing. Okay, so let me highlight that real quick so you can see it. H is differentiable and decreasing between 0 and 4. 
So if H is decreasing, and I have these points somewhere on the graph, I could envision something that would look like a function of decreasing like this per se. So we had 0 at 30, 1 at 13, 3 at 5, and then 4 at 4. It's decreasing of some kind. And we want to know from this, was this going to be an over or an um, under estimate? So this one is actually an over estimate. And the reason of that being is this interpretation of, um, let me go ahead and draw the graph. As far as when we were looking at our Riemann sums, if we had left Riemann sums, the interpretation could be like this. So it's obviously going to be an over approximation, but we don't want to know that just from their graph. We want to know that from verbiage. So we're going to go ahead and say that this is an overestimate since h of t is decreasing. Okay, so it's an overestimate. Oops. And that's because h of t is decreasing. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to part E. Part, C sa part E says estimate h prime of 2. So when I go back over here and I want to estimate h prime of 2, I'm going to first of all try to find my 2 value, if you will. Okay, so if my input t is 2, whoops, not there, you're going to see that it exists between 1 and 3. Okay. So that's the estimate that we're going to be getting from over here because our at value is 2. Okay, So when we see estimate a derivative at a certain point, it's what we did back in Algebra 1 with slope as far as the average rate of change. Okay, That estimate is that average rate of change of this um, derivative. So it's just f of b minus f of a over b minus a. We're going to do that with 2. Okay, so if we're looking at 2 from our graph, 2 would exist here. Then I'm going to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, so that becomes 5 minus 13 over 3 minus 1. Okay, so 5 minus 13, we're going to get a negative 9. And then 3 minus 1, we're going to get... Actually, whoops, negative 8. And then 3 minus 1 is going to give me 2. So my answer is going to become a negative 4. Okay. Now think about this. If over here we were looking at h of t and we were doing the difference quotient between velocity function pieces, and I did the difference quotient on that, then this is going to be the average rate of change with an acceleration interpretation. Okay. So I did these values from the table, and the values from the table are velocity values, if you will, otherwise f prime of x. So when I do the difference quotient here, its interpretation is going to be over here as an acceleration, if you will, otherwise an f double prime. So our units of measure are not just going to be gallons per minute. They're actually going to be gallons per minute squared. Okay, so now let's move on to f. It says, is there a time between 0 and 4 minutes when the rate at which the water is being poured into the uh, pool is equal to the rate at which it's leaking from the pool? Okay, so we're trying to say when it's entering the pool, otherwise the in rate, when is it equal to the out rate? Okay, so if I have an equation just where it's equal to, I can move this L of T by subtracting it to the left side so that I have it equal to 0. Okay, again, this is going back to the other problem that we let a prime of t equal this interpretation of the difference between the rate in and the rate out. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and look at um, our limits, if you will. Okay, so if we're talking about from 0 to 4, then we could say, well, Let's go ahead and plug in 0 here, here, and here and see what we get. So we would get a prime of 0 is equal to h of 0 minus l of 0. Okay. And then if I did the same thing but this time plugged in 4 here, here, and here, then I would have a different equation that had a prime of 4 
is equal to h of 4 minus l of 4. All right. So we know h of 0, okay, over here. Let's go to the graph. h of 0 is 30. So we're going to say 30 minus, and then h of 4 for our other equation was 4. So we're going to put 4 here, okay? We still have a prime of 0, and we still have a prime of 4. Now let's find what is L of 0, okay? So over here, L of 0 is 0 divided by, again, I'm just putting 0 here and here in my L function. So it'll be 0 divided by 3, which is going to be 0, okay? So that will be 0 over here. And then L of 4, well, let's put 4 there. I have 16 plus 9 is 25. The square root of that is 5 on the bottom. And then I have 4 times, so that will be 100. So it will be 100 divided by 5, which is going to give you 20. So you have A prime of 4 is going to be this negative 16 representation. And A prime at 0 is a positive, okay, 30. So between this positive, Okay, which existed at, oops, let me highlight it in orange to match up. Oops. Which existed at zero, it's going to be at four and negative. So since we know that this is a differentiable function, we know that it's going to be continuous as well. Okay, so with all that being said, um, as far as how we're going to see if it would equal, it's going to be dealing with intermediate value theorem. Okay, so IBT is happening here because we have this negative, or sorry, this um, positive and this negative value to where when it was equal to, it's whenever when I'm adding them up together, I already get zero somewhere in between, if you will. So we're going to say by the intermediate value theorem, theorem Therefore, there must exist, okay, there must exist a time t, and we're going to say on the interval from 0 to 4, non-inclusive, okay, um, such that the rate, so we're going to say such that a prime of t is going to be equal to 0. Okay, and that correlates with us setting these equal to each other, then moving them to one side and setting that equal to zero, which again, right here is representing, let me highlight it in purple, that A prime of T. Okay, so that is one way that you can show by intermediate value theorem. Okay, H of T and L of T are both continuous because they were differentiable. So by default, they are continuous. Okay. So let's go ahead and mention that as well. H of t and L of t are continuous. The second stipulation on intermediate value theorem is that their y values are not the same. You see that this y value is not the same as this one. Okay, so you can say to um, as far as this a prime of 0 is not equal to a prime of 4. Okay, and then therefore, because of the continuity and because the y values are not equal to one another, the third part is let k, and I'm running out of room, so I'll just write it down here, let k equal 0. We got that from setting it equal to each other over here, and we were able to guarantee it by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, let's go to part G now. Let me erase that. Part G is same. The pool can hold at most 200 gallons of water. So at time, T is equal to four minutes. The hole in the pool is fixed, but water continues to fill the pool at the rate of H of T. Set up but do not solve an equation involving one or more integrals that could be used to find the time W when the pool first begins to overflow. All right, so there's a lot going on in this problem. It is a first fundamental theorem interpretation, okay, where we have this um, integral of the derivative velocity function is equal to the displacement or the change in positions or the change in amounts in this way. 
And all I did again was just the rewrite with our initial value problem of f of a plus the displacement to equal our final value. Okay. And what we're going to do is we want to account for, just like we did before, this will be two equations. Okay. It's going to account for the rate in and the rate out. Okay. We already know that we want to know at time is equal to four is basically when we're going to end. Our beginning time is still zero. So we're going to set this up as what will that final value be whenever I get, here we go, f of four. f of four is going to equal f of a, which is f of zero, because again, this is our a value. Four is our b value. And it's going to be adding the accumulated change. Okay, again, this is a rate in, rate out, and it's accounting for both of them in this particular um, part of the question. So we want to go from zero to let's say w of the rate in function. Okay, and the rate out function, yes, it's subtracting because it's decreasing. It's um, decreasing whenever it's leaking out. So it's from zero to four, and it's going to be L of t for our leaking out part. Okay, and this we're going to see what do we get as far as a final answer here in just a bit. So let's interpret, let's slow down just a little bit and look at these bounds. From zero to four, it's leaking. And the reason why that's, that is, is because it says the hole is fixed at four minutes. So that leaking rate out only happened for four minutes. That's why we have our limits of integration only from zero to four. And we want to see when will this actually equal um, 200, okay? So if we wanted to see at most is 200, then we're trying to truly solve for the variable that we're looking for is W. We want to see how many minutes will happen that it will then reach this 200, okay? So we start, okay, so all we care about is reaching 200. So this F of four is kind of a little bit negligible as far as that first fundamental theorem. And we're saying our starting value of F of zero, which again, from the original problem said that we started at 120 gallons, and I'm adding this accumulated change, we're trying to see when will it equal 200, okay? This is a setup but do not solve. Whoops. This is a setup but do not solve problem. And ideally, with the setup, all we're going to be doing is solving for W. So if you had a calculator and you want to solve it out, yes, you could go ahead and solve it out there if you wanted to define that W. Okay. All right. So let's go to part H. H says L prime of 2 is equal to approximately 4.8. And using correct units, interpret the meaning of what we just um, found, okay? So if L prime of 2, we've got to go back to the first page. L of 2, a reminder, L of t, that is, was given to us as a velocity function. So if we're looking at L prime, well, the derivative of velocity, this is an acceleration interpretation, okay? So we're kind of looking at this as F double prime, if you will. So already we know our um, units that used to be gallons per minute are going to immediately be gallons per minute squared because we took that derivative of L and thus got to the acceleration, if you will. Okay, and we want to know L of 2 or what's the interpretation of L prime of 2 is equal to 4.8. So we know that the rate... Oops, get a pen. The rate the water leaks the rate the water leaks. Now here's something. Let me move this over. The rate the water leaks, you could say is this, but we're going to go even further because we don't want to say the rate the water leaks. Because if we say the rate the water leaks, we're saying velocity, okay? But if we say the rate the water leaks is 
increasing, then whatever number we show, which in this case is 4.8, that's interpreted as an acceleration. It's not interpreted as a velocity, okay? So that's very, very, very important because if you just put the rate the water leaks is, well, then you shouldn't have uh, minutes for minutes squared. You should just have minutes. But if you put is increasing, that's the key. That increasing kind of goes back with that whole, if F prime of X is positive, then F of X is increasing. Otherwise, if F um, double prime is positive, then F prime is increasing. That's kind of what's going on here. So the rate of the water leaking, that's the velocity, is increasing, says the acceleration. That is why I have these units right here, okay? So we're gonna say is increasing at 4.8 gallons per minute squared, okay? And you could say at, T is equal to two minutes. So be careful with that. Um, making sure that you're including or not including, where appropriate, these increasing interpretations of acceleration or the velocity. And last but not least, part I. We're looking at the rate that the hose water is entering the pool can be modeled by this function. So they're giving you now a function. They're not saying, look at the table for the rate in anymore. They're saying, look at this equation. This is your rate in function. It is a velocity because it's um, gallons per minute. So we're going to say that this is that velocity. Otherwise, F prime of X interpretation. And we're going to use this model and see at what time T is the amount of water in the pool the greatest. So we are going to be looking at per candidates test because we want to see the amount is like the absolute max, if you will. So immediately, we can go to our table and start building our table. And we're going to look at, in this problem, we're only looking between 0 and 4 minutes. Okay? And we want to know the amount. When is the amount of water, let me circle that, the amount of water the greatest? Okay, so first of all, we know our candidates of 0 and 4 because they're endpoints, but now let's find the critical points. We want to find the critical points um, to use this candidates test here. Okay, so if that's A of T there, we know our critical points are going to come from A prime of T is equal to 0. Okay, so A prime of T is equal to 0. Well, we know our A of T function that was given to us is this one right here. Let me go ahead and write it out. Our A of T is equal to 120 plus, let me make some room here. Plus from zero to an established time that we're looking for of this rate in problem. Okay, so this one's the N, if you will. So we have E prime of T because if we integrate the velocity function, we'll get the accumulated amount. And then the out function is still that L of T. Okay, so that's still our out. And we're going to look at um, T there because we're not saying it could go to four minutes. It could be somewhere in between zero and four. Okay, so we're going to say we're trying to find that spot of where it will yield your maximum amount. Okay, so we'll say L of T dt. Okay, so if this is a of t, and I'm wanting to basically find the derivative of all this, um, second fundamental theorem says that if I take the derivative of this side, I have a prime of t, 120 zeros out, and this right here will just become e prime of t. Okay, whenever you're taking the derivative of an integral. And then the other one will become L of T. Okay, and we want to set all of this equal to zero and then solve for our value. Okay, so we want to find when basically this is equal to zero so that we can solve when that is. Now, there's many ways that you can use the calculator to solve this out. 
But when you do, your T value is going to become 1.354372 or 3, however you want to round it to. Okay. A good idea is typically to use at least six decimal places somewhere in the middle. So we're going to say, um, as you can see in the key, we're going to call this, let this be, let B equal this value of 1.354373. Okay, so we'll say B is here, and now we're just trying to find what are these values, and then we're done. We're good to go. And again, this these values are going to come from A of T, and A of T is going to be right here as far as our in and out added with our initial value. Okay, so this is a calculator active problem for sure, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can do that to solve for not only this value of B down here, but also how you can use it to get these other values here. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to first solve for when the derivative function, otherwise 30 over t plus 1 to the 5 fourths, minus L of t is equal to 0. Okay, or otherwise whenever they're equal to each other, if you will. Okay, so let's go ahead and store these functions. I'm going to go ahead and put 30 over, and it was t plus 1. We have t plus 1, and it's raised to the power of 5 fourths. Okay, so let me make sure I've got that. Yep, and this is e prime of t. Okay, so let's go ahead and store this function as e prime of t. We'll just say as e um, of t, if you will. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to this function here of L of t, and we're going to store that function in the calculator as well. And the L of t was given to us way up here, okay, right here, of 25t over, whoops, 25t over, let me go ahead and put that, 25t over um, the square root of t squared plus 9. Okay, so here we go, the square root of t squared plus 9. Now from, and we're going to store this as L of t. So in control, store this as L of t. Remember, we wanted to know when L of t is equal to E of t and solve for that value. So you could use a calculator as menu 3, 1 and solve when is your stored function, whoops, when is your stored function of E of t, notice that it's bolded because it's stored, equal to L of t. And we want a comma t because we want it to solve for that specific value, okay? And then we'll just press enter to find when that actually does exist, okay? So let's go ahead and go to right there. So t is equal to what we got over here of 1.354373-ish. That's what we got over here, okay? So that's how we got B, if you will, that I'm going to go ahead and, and you can leave it as B. If you let it be B here, you don't have to rewrite it in your table for work over here, okay? So now we're going to finish up. We are almost done. We're going to finish up by creating our equation that exists with the in and the out added with 120. So we have 120 plus our in. Okay, so here we go. Our E of T, I know I labeled it as E of T, but it's really E prime. And what I'm doing is I'm storing this function right here. Remember, E prime, the way I have it stored in my calculator, is as E of T. Okay, so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to create this 120 plus the integral. Got to keep track of how you store it. Zero to T, and the way we stored it was E of T in respect to t, and then we're going to minus our integral of the leaking out. So we have this one from 0 to t of L of t, and then it's in respect to t. This is our a of t stored function. So we'll control store it as a of t because we want to find out what are these values going to be? What are these y values going to be when I plug in my 0, my b and my 4. And again, this b is over here. Okay, so let's plug in 0 into this function. So a of 0 gives us 120. 
So we're going to go ahead over here and write 120. Oops. Now, if I plug in my B value, it's simply saying, what is A of, what did we get up here? Okay, so let me take off this T equals. We only want the quantitative. And we get 135.835, rounding up to um, 836. So I'm a rounding up kind of person. We'll put 135.836. And finally, what do we get when we plug in 4? Oops, let me go ahead and push control enter so I get a nice decimal answer. And we get 109.751. And obviously your max is going to be 135. So you'll write max is 135.836 gallons. Whoops, gallons. So three decimals on our final, final answers. Six on our answers throughout a problem, at least six. We're going to say at... T is equal to 1.35 over here, um, 1.354, 1.354 minutes.